My name is Mike Parisa. I'm the historian here at the National Museum of Industrial History. I want to thank everyone for coming out and uh, taking a break from Music Fest today. So it's really encouraging to see uh, everybody here. So I'm looking forward to this presentation. It talks about photography that was done in the plant in 2006. I remember the place back then. It was locked up. You had to get past Captain Harris. I'm not sure how you did it, but I'm looking forward to hearing the story. <laughs> and um, it was really quite a time to, 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 to document the place. So it was basically locked up, left the way the uh, uh, workers had abandoned it in the uh, 1990s. And it was just a, a beautiful grounds for photography. So you're going to see documentary photography, and I think it's really artistic photography uh, when you get down to it, because some of these images are going to be just beautiful. But the people who are going to be talking today are Stephen Landis. He was a photographer, and today he works in the automotive industry, where he's been employed for uh, nearly two decades. He's also an inventor, a creative writer, enjoys mountain climbing, and phot photographing the beautiful, bizarre, and especially the hard to access or abandoned places. He regrets having been too young to ever have worked at Bethlehem Seal, but counts the rare access he had exploring and photographing, photographing sorry, the hollow grounds of the former flagship plant as among the best moments in his life. His father, John Landis, is a steel plant tour guide with historic Bethlehem museums and sites, and is often asked if he worked for Bethlehem Steel. In fact, he's actually a graphic designer and professor emeritus of art, but on tour days, he feels like he does work for this icon of American heavy industry, albeit as a looper, the name Bethlehem Steel gave to management trainees on a loop course around the plant as they learned about the company. It's with this perspective that John wrote text to accompany the photographs, Art as he is by the beauty of our industrial heritage and eager to pass along his continuously evolving knowledge of the might and majesty of the seal industry of the past. And the continuously evolving knowledge is something that struck home for me because I'm actually cited in the book as a reference. So it's nice to see somebody learning from me and spreading the word to other people. And I can't wait to see the presentation. Come on up. Thanks, Mike. Appreciate that. Yes, I'm an imposter. I did not work for Bethlehem Steel, as Mike says. And uh, I learned it with a steep learning curve, but uh, not by doing it. Sometimes I have to tell you this story. Sometimes I used to say uh, at the beginning of a tour, uh, I want you to tell me at the end of the tour what I said wrong. And uh, I would go through the tour, which lasts about an hour and a half, and at the end of the tour, I would say to the person who was usually a former steel worker, whom I knew he was a steel worker, um, I would say, well, tell me what I said wrong. And to the person, they said, uh, I don't know of anything you said wrong. I knew my job well, and I did it well, but you got the overview, the arc of existence of the company. So it made me feel better uh, being a, uh, a looper forever. Um, they called them loopers. They were middle management people, and they uh, were learning about the plant, and Bethlehem Steel loved to play golf, the top executives, and they always called it a loop of golf instead of a round of golf or 18 holes. It was a loop. Uh, we think it's a Scottish expression, probably, where, of course, golf came from anyway. And uh, so uh, a new employee, they would take them around, and, of course, they didn't know uh, about the plant or, or the safety rules, for that matter. I wasn't necessarily going to show you this, but I will. They used to put a, uh, a red X, a red X on the top of their hard hat. And uh, I always like to think that, uh, yes, it showed that you were just learning about the plant, but also if you were up on a crane and happened to have a wrench in your hand and didn't particularly like the new middle management employee, you could mistakenly drop that wrench. It was a great target. <laughs> I've never had anybody corroborate or deny that. OK. <laughs> On with the show. So I'm John Landis. My son is Steve Landis, and he'll pick up later in the show. And this is indeed an overview, not in depth, but it's somewhat similar to what I do on my tours, which are called the Rise and Fall of Bethlehem Steel, which uh, we do uh, Friday, Saturday, Sunday at 1 p.m. And there's the ubiquitous logo, of course, that uh, was around so much, and unfortunately we don't see nearly as much today. 
We made iron and steel. Stand where I can see this and not have to look up all the time. I'll do this. We made iron and steel on industrial scale in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania for nearly 150 years. And we were by far the major employer of Bethlehem and the surrounding area. We were number eight on the Fortune 500 list at one time. We were right behind General Motors and AT&T of the day when we were number eight on the list. We were a strong company in profits and in production. Always number two, however, to U.S. Steel. But I always have to add, we made an excellent product consistently. We were blue chip on the New York Stock Exchange. In fact, our stock doubled during the 1990s. Even though we were uh, on our way out, the stock doubled because we had announced that we were uh, doing some restructuring and, uh, and it boded well with the stock exchange and the people who bought stocks, so our prices went up greatly. And we were a bellwether of the nation's economy. As Bethlehem Steel went, so the nation went. And yet today, we are gone. To understand the arc of existence of the company, we have to understand what it is that we did. And you notice I say we all along, even though I admit I did not work for the company, I feel very much a part of it today. Uh, I'm an honorary member, if you will, of the, uh, of the Bethlehem Steel family. We made steel by first making molten iron. And the three ingredients to make molten iron our iron ore first. The definition of an ore is really a rock that can economically give up its element. In this case, the element is iron, Fe, on the periodic table of the elements. Specifically, the iron ore that we use was a low-grade iron ore, no more than 20 to 40 percent of pure iron, a lot of waste in it, and it was called taconite. And we mined it in various places. We had three mines fairly near where we are today in eastern Pennsylvania. We also mined iron ore in Canada, Central and South America, and Liberia in North Africa. And interestingly, when we found a deposit of iron ore or any of the other products that we use, um, we not just leased the land and mined it, we bought it. This was a red flag, and toward the end of our operation, you'll see, toward the end of my, two, my uh, presentation, you'll see, uh, uh, just why it was a red flag, but we purchased it. We didn't just lease the land. We were very independent, very autonomous. And here's taconite. We didn't just leave it in the rock form that it came from, which is all irregular, no two pieces the same, but instead we processed it by breaking it into very fine particles called a sinter, to which we mix clay and water and made these balls which made them much easier to transport and much easier once we got into the furnace, catch fire and melt, because the purpose is to melt these balls. And we have billions and billions of these. And if you walk along the Hoover Mason Trestle, you'll see billions and billions of these. You can even buy a few if you want at the gift shop right outside the door here. Second ingredient was Coke. It was the heat source. Coke is really coal, heated to a high temperature with no air. And we mostly used bituminous that we got from Kentucky and West Virginia, but we also used anthracite, which is hard coal. Bituminous is soft coal. Anthracite's much more expensive, burns very clean for home use, but what we're doing with it is we're converting it to coke by heating it at a very high temperature with no air. And so it becomes almost pure carbon, and it has no moisture in it. And so when it burns, it burns very hot. The third ingredient was limestone. Limestone is really a fossil from the Ordovician period of geologic history. 500 million years ago, limestone deposits were formed. This entire area where we are, from the tropics to well north of here and all the way out to Ohio, was covered by a vast inland sea. And in that sea were tiny sea creatures. And as the sea receded over the eons of time, those tiny sea creatures up to the bottom and their skeletal remains are what makes limestone deposits today. I was flying from ABE to uh, O'Hare um, a few months ago and I out the window as best I could I got a picture in south central Pennsylvania of uh, a deposit of limestone. Very easy to spot from the air. 
Uh, and in fact, where we got our limestone from mostly was South Central Pennsylvania, the area around Gettysburg, Adams County, Pennsylvania. Again, we owned the deposits. What the, uh, what the limestone does is it acts as a flux. It encourages the coke and the taconite to merge together and to form molten iron. And it also starts to take out some of the impurities Limestone is used in a number of industries to uh, act as a filter to take out impurities, and we used it for that as well. But it also acted as a flux to get the uh, two main ingredients to come together. We stored these ingredients all down at what we called the ore yards, even though there's more than one thing stored there. And uh, we had uh, overhead cranes, three of them. One remains. It has the logo on it for Wind Creek if you came in from that direction to, to town. You can still see one of our uh, ore cranes, and you can see the piles there. And we called it the ore yards. And so there was a problem how to get it all the way up to where we had the blast furnaces. So we uh, commissioned two architects from Chicago named Frank Hoover and Arthur Mason. Uh, they were inventors, architects, tinkerers, and they came up with the idea that if we have a trestle 46 foot high, and it's a railroad trestle upon which we can run broad gauge cars because the iron ore is gonna be heavy in the cars. And it's about a half a mile long, a little short of a half a mile long. We can bring a continuous shuttle of the raw materials up to the furnaces. It had to be 24 hours a day, seven days a week, long before there was such a term as 24 seven, but it was a continuous shuttle. And here's what the cars look like. The workers started to name these cars Larry's. We think the term came from lorry, which is what they call trucks in UK to this day. We had a lot of Welsh coal miners who worked for us in the early years, and uh, they found it easier to work for Bethlehem Steel than to work in the coal mines of Pennsylvania. And so uh, they started to call these cars Larry's. We think it's a pronunciation variation on lorry, a material bearing truck in UK. For those of you that might be traction enthusiasts, I know there's some people uh, everywhere who love trolleys, interurban streetcars, etc. cetera. Uh, same controllers. Uh, the upper is the brake, and the lower thing that looks like a crank is the speed control. And it's a very simple operation, a brake and a speed controller, and that's what uh, made the Larrys go. They had air brakes. This thing on the end, very similar to a city streetcar or a trolley, is called the troller and it's a pulley-like thing that picks up the uh, electricity from the overhead wire. I've never heard this to be accurate, but I'm gonna say that it's probably 600 volts DC overhead wire, which a lot of streetcars were uh, and trolleys, but uh, that one I'm not, I'm not positive of. But this indeed picked up from the overhead wire, the electricity didn't make the car run. We then dropped the material into bins, and there were steel bins that were underneath where the rails came in, and you can still to this day see some of the raw materials. There's some coke on the left there in the bin. We now had to get the material into the furnace and we used what we called skip tubs. It was a continuous hoist kind of mechanism where one car went up and the other came down. And as the car went up and the other one came down, when it got to the top, it opened up. It's a very simplified way of showing it, but you get the idea. Uh, and now the material is in the furnace. And to give you an idea of the way the furnace looks, uh, when I'm giving a tour, uh, I very often uh, at Furnace A uh, have to say, you're not seeing a furnace right now. You're seeing the uh, skip hoist that goes up and down. And so what does the furnace look like? You'll see them better as we walk along, but it looks roughly like a lava lamp. Or for those of you who remember this, a 1960s Michelob beer bottle. They were very distinctive in shape and they looked a lot like uh, a blast furnace. And the idea, it's interesting what happened to the tea there, I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> Well, the idea is what we're trying to do is melt the iron ore and we put an S in front of it and it's the word smelt. So we call it a smelting of the iron ore and we call the furnaces smelters. 
and it took 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit, a very high temperature, around 2,800, things start to heat and really um, go to a, start to become a liquid. So 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Again, the uh, T is dropped off. I don't know why. <laughs> Very strange, but uh, computers will do things like that. And to encourage this high heat, there were things that workers called stoves. Those these silo-like things that you see on the left. They held 30 pounds per square inch of heated compressed air, and it blew in at the base of the furnace. And this is why it's called a blast furnace. It blasted in at the base, and uh, the compressed air did two things. It, it added to the formula for uh, heating the uh, material up but it also made the material hotter in the furnace and it kept the material swirling so that it cooked consistently. I'll use the term cooked consistently from the top to the bottom. Out of the blast furnace comes, I always have to say to my people on a tour, we're not to steal yet. Out of the blast furnace comes big iron. We think that got its name from early days when a blob of molten iron would come out of the furnace and run down troughs to ingots, molds at the bottom of troughs, and it looked to the workers like a mother pig, a sow with suckling piglets. And the name is used around the world, although I always like to tell people, particularly from a distance, that we have a, a corner on a specific part of pig iron, namely the Iron Pigs, which is a, a AAA <laughs> baseball team, uh, and uh, that's ours. but. Pig iron, that belongs to the world, that expression. And we unloaded the pig iron into what the workers called subs, mostly. Some people call them bottle cars, torpedo cars, uh, but they uh, were a, a vessel within a vessel, basically, which is what the uh, furnace itself was. Um, an inside uh, refractory brick that prevents the material from touching the outside to which it would bond to. You had to be very careful when you loaded these cars. You didn't want the material to go down on the rails to which it would bond or the outside of the car, which would destroy. And slag is that uh, waste material that gets vacuumed off, uh, for want of a better expression, and put in what the workers called cinder pots, which were the cars that uh, could go down toward Hellertown area and dump the uh, slag down the hillside. It looked like a lot going to waste. Uh, bright orange, dramatic, when it was dumping down the hillside. Uh, and here's what it looked like when it cooled and hardened. It uh, became a, a black, almost like an obsidian, kind of dense black. And it uh, was sold then for use in airport, tar airport tarmacs, road surfaces, and also as an ingredient in cement. So it didn't all go to waste, although much of it did. The next step is to convert the pig iron into steel. Converting it into steel meant removing the impurities, carbon, sulfur, phosphorus, silicon, and nitrogen. And in the early days, the Bessemer process and the open hearth process were the ones that converted it from iron to steel. Bessemer was the earliest one in the open hearth process. But in later days, after the Second World War particularly, the basic oxygen furnace is the way that we use to uh, convert the iron into steel. And the BOF, as the workers called it, the basic oxygen furnace, used to take out the carbon, but not all the carbon, and we did it by blowing pure oxygen through the iron, removing impurities, leaving some of the carbon in, important for the strength of the steel. And we blew pure oxygen through the iron, and it converted the iron into steel. And steel is four to six times stronger than iron. It's flexible, it's not brittle, and it's stable in temperature extremes, but steel and iron are very similar to each other. It's the removal of a certain amount of impurities that makes steel come from iron. We then had to do shaping, fabricating, and finishing of the steel. Usually involved heating it up in one way or another. Starting to get the shapes for the steel. Common shapes are what they call billets and blooms, depending upon the cross section, billets and blooms. And we were known for cable wire, particularly at this site. We made a lot of wire which got stranded into cable kind of thing that would be used for suspension bridges. 
We made a lot of flat sheet steel, the kind of thing that got sold to manufacturers of automobiles and appliances. Slab steel. Tubular steel that got drilled out and made into seamless pipes. Lots of railroad track, tens of thousands of miles of railroad track and railroad wheels, and they were all made of steel. And of course, structural steel. The thing that we were particularly known for toward the later part of our existence was mainly structural steel. Steel needed to have some finishing done, and in simple terms, tempering hardened the steel, made it tougher. Annealing actually softened the steel to make it easier to work. Tinning was putting a tin coating on top of the steel. Pickling was using a solution much like a vinegar solution that gave a tooth to the surface of the steel. Brick blasting did the same thing, but with a pulverized uh, high pressure uh, blast of particles. And galvanizing is the steel covered with a zinc coating. And so there was still lots of finishing that needed to be done. We had more than 40 major outbuildings on our property, and our property started to get very narrow and long, almost four and a half miles in length, and sometimes squeezed by the river at the top there, the Lehigh River, and the railroad and the city down below. Some places our, our property was very narrow. We're in, I know I brought this for a reason, That's where we are right now, where electric products, uh, electric uh, motors and so forth got uh, worked on. Um, and that's the building that we're in right now. We had 400 miles of in-plant railroad track. It was a big red flag because in order to get something to go out the door to the customer, it had to go back and forth multiple times uh, along those uh, some of those 400 miles of in-plant railroad track. Some of it was narrow gauge railroad track, some of it was standard gauge. Standard gauge is four feet, eight and a half inches. Narrow gauge is less than that, sometimes as small as two foot gauge. Here's some of the products we made. In the very early years, one of our proudest products was the main axle for the World's Columbian Exposition Ferris wheel, the first Ferris wheel. And it was a huge casting right in the center. And we were very proud of that. We also, in the early days, made something completely the opposite size the cylinders for Lindbergh's airplane. So two extremes in size. We made the Golden Gate Bridge structure. Uh, we took it from Bethlehem to Philadelphia by rail and we took it by ship through the Panama Canal to the West Coast. The George Washington Bridge, that's our steel. George Washington Bridge incidentally was meant to be covered by concrete, but during the 1930s they ran out of money. And so we end up with what aesthetically, I think, is much more interesting bridge than the heaviness that it would have been if it were uh, covered with concrete. But George Washington Bridge is ours. Even the Verrazano Narrows Bridge, the very center section is ours. So we're literally coast to coast with the Golden Gate Bridge on the west coast and the Verrazano Narrows on the east coast. Our steel is in the Cathedral of Learning, which is the University of Pittsburgh. Pitt likes us to call it University of Pittsburgh these days instead of Pitt. But their primo building on their campus, the very center of U.S. steel, is Bethlehem Steel. I have to be careful how much I rub that in. My wife's from Bethlehem. It's a great city. I love Bethlehem. I, I love uh, Pittsburgh. She's from Pittsburgh. Uh, and I have to be careful how much I, I say nasty things. Merchandise Mart huge building in Chicago, that's our steel. Hoover Dam, all the piping and structure for Hoover Dam, even though it looks like there's so much concrete there, all the piping and structure is Bethlehem steel. And if you've ever driven from New Hampshire into Maine on Route 95, you've gone across the Piscataqua River Bridge, which is one of our later bridges, very aesthetic looking bridge between New Hampshire and Maine. Our steel is in the Rainbow Bridge, in Niagara Falls. It's an international bridge. Our steel is also in the Commodore Barry Bridge outside Philadelphia and the Betsy Ross Bridge. But we didn't do too much business in Philadelphia because they had an ordinance that said nothing could go higher than William Penn's statue on City Hall. And as a result, uh, when they changed the ordinance in the late 1980s, we were basically out of business. So we were not making 
things that we could uh, make their tall buildings, which today Philadelphia has lots of tall buildings. But back in those days, you couldn't go higher than top of City Hall. This is the Waldorf Astoria. The Waldorf Astoria is uh, doing some renewal, and it's interesting, the promotional thing that I came across online, uh, why they cut the heads of the waiters off, I do not know, but I did not design it. But uh, they're really featuring the steel that's in the Waldorf Astoria. That's our steel, and apparently they're undergoing a refurbishing, reopening later this year. Rockefeller Plaza is our steel. Empire State Building, center core, is Bethlehem Steel. And in fact, we had enough buildings in New York, Pulaski Skyway also, uh, the um, Madison Square Garden, uh, that we actually had 80% of the New York skyline during the 1940s was Bethlehem Steel. Our shipbuilding division built ships during the First World War. This is the only ship that fought in two world wars. It's the USS Texas. It's going to be berthed in Galveston, permanently berthed there soon, uh, undergoing some refurbishing. And uh, it's a battleship, and our steel is in that ship in the First World War. Texas, and it's in uh, number two machine shop, which is a building that's still on our property, unfortunately not open to the public, but it's a building that's about a fifth of a mile long, and uh, just gives you an idea of the scale of the things that we made. This is a, a casting for a uh, huge turret for USS uh, Pennsylvania in this case. I said Texas, I'm wrong. It's for the USS Pennsylvania. Get an idea of the scale. And in World War II, our shipbuilding division was very important. We got a call to arms from Franklin Roosevelt. He called our president, Eugene Grace, and he said, I need from you people a ship a day. And during the Second World War, we indeed built a ship a day. This was from about uh, late 1942. The war was not going well. We were losing a lot of shipping in the North Atlantic to German U-boats, and increasingly it looked like the war was going to be a sea war on the in the Pacific, and so we needed a ship a day, and we built 1,121 ships. We made the components in number two machine shop right on this property, and since the Lehigh is far too shallow to float ships in, uh, we sent them by rail to either Sparrows Point south of Baltimore, or we sent them to Brooklyn Navy Yard, where uh, our shipbuilding division assembled the ships, floated them on either the Chesapeake or the open ocean. 1,121 ships. It's been said that we would not have won the Second World War were it not what went on in number two machine shop, just feet from where we are right now. We built the USS Missouri, which is the ship that the Japanese signed the unconditional surrender on. We had 3,000 workers over three shifts during the Second World War. And of those 3,000 workers, because a lot of the, uh, 30,000, I'm sorry, I'm looking at it saying it's 3,000, it's 30,000. Of the 30,000 worked on this property alone, three shifts coming and going during the Second World War, 2,200 were women working in hard hat jobs on the floor, as it was called uh, during the Second World War, replacing men that were overseas. Women did a good job for us for two reasons. Number one is they read the instruction book of the machine they were working on, and they also followed the safety rules. They were resented by the men at first, but the men realized that the women did a very good job, and so reluctantly they were accepted. Now about the workers at Bethlehem Steel. During peacetime, we had 20,000 over three shifts. And it was indeed dangerous work. Statistics came out in uh, 
Well, I'll say this later. I'll tell you that later. Um, the work was heavy, for sure. Everything was made of metal and things were heavy. Everything was moving. It was a very animated place to work. You had to be constantly careful of things moving near you. Usually things were hot. It was invariably noisy. And it was often dirty. Statistics came out in 1909 that said 10% of the people who worked at Bethlehem Steel died in industrial accidents. And 21% were injured in industrial accidents. So it was a dangerous place to work. This was before OSHA. Things, of course, improved with Occupational Safety and, safety and Health uh, Administration. The workers uh, used a check, as they called it. I have one around my neck. You would certainly not wear it around your neck because it might get caught in machinery. You'd probably keep it in your pocket, but it was important to get into the uh, steel mill, the equivalent of a uh, magnetic card today to get uh, past security. Not everything was great between labor and management. We had a major strike in 1910. The strike was over forced overtime, and it's always over wages. And in 1910, the forced overtime caused the workers to have a four-day work stoppage. They stopped work for, uh, no, I'm sorry, in, in 1910, it was a 107-day work stoppage. It was basically a wildcat strike. There was no, uh, there was no union at the time. And uh, the uh, president of the company, whose name was Schwab, not the same Schwab as the investment people, uh, had to send in uh, mounted state police to charge into the crowd with billy clubs, which of course made the crowd of strikers even angrier. We had a second major strike right before the Second World War. Um, the workers wanted to have a representation by a national union. And uh, so there's, you can see it says Steelworkers Organizing Union. This is in July of 41. We were in the war by December 41, as I imagine you know. And uh, so this was a four day work stoppage in this case. The, the management reluctantly said you can have a union, but it has to be what's called an open shop, which means you don't have to be a member of the union to work here. Closed shop would mean you had to be a member of the union. Closed shop today is illegal, but in those days, a closed shop was not illegal. That union representing the workers became United Steel Workers of America. Prior to this, uh, there was no union. Uh, if you had a gripe, you went over to the administration building and talked to uh, top management over tea and cookies and nothing ever got done. And now, United Steel Workers of America had teeth. And just to show the value that we placed on women, uh, there's a, um, a recruiting uh, button. Because it was an open shop, you didn't have to be a member of the union. We were always in the process of recruiting members. And notice the ethnic variations that are shown here and gender variations shown uh, for the uh, the button in this case, in the illustration, ethnic and gender variations. We had quite a bit of diversity working here. We had uh, more than 30 different nationalities who worked together and got along together, even though they didn't speak the same language in many cases. There was a common goal to go home safely at the end of the shift. And also, there was a pride in what the people made. Some of those workers that were from various nationalities are buried at St. Michael's Cemetery, which is visible from the plant. And you can see where uh, we are today. We'd be looking up at the cemetery and where this picture was taken, which is taken by Walker Evans, a famous photographer from the 1930s, the Depression era, uh, looking down at the plant. The workers watched out for each other. There was a healthy competition. The Irish guy didn't want the Polish guy. It looked like he was doing a better job than he did. It was hard work. You went home tired. But you were building America, and you had a pride in what you were doing. And I think it was that way right to the end. Something major changed in 1959. There was a nationwide steel stri strike. It was not just Bethlehem Steel, it was the entire country. And it was over new technologies coming online. A machine that required five people suddenly required only two people because of new technology, 1959. And so the workers went on strike because management wanted to renegotiate all the union contracts and the unions would not hear of it. And so the strike lasted 117 days. 
and it affect the entire national economy, the importance of steel. There was a cascading effect to the national economy. If you are on strike, you don't get a paycheck, and so you're not able to buy groceries on a, in simple terms. There's no need now to mine or quarry anything, so nothing's coming in the door to be uh, smelted by us and turned into steel. There's nothing going out the door. And remember, this is not just Bethlehem Steel, this is the entire country's steel uh, plants. There are no new automobiles and trucks being made. There's no new washers, dryers, refrigerators, buildings, bridges, and railroad box cars. And even, and here's where it started at home, the food supply was affected greatly because tin cans are really steel cans with a tin coating on top of them. And there's so much canned goods there were in those days and still today that this affected the food supply of the entire country. I remember my parents talking about it. Uh, 1959, I was in 10th grade, and I remember them talking about the uh, food supply being affected by the steel worker strike. First, it's like, how could that affect the, st the uh, food supply? But tin cans is the answer. And it really hit the federal government when there were no new military equipment uh, being built during the early years of the Cold War. And so President Eisenhower, the President of the United States at the time, considered this a national emergency. And he sent uh, Richard Nixon to uh, negotiate, but while he did it, he activated a part of the Taft-Hartley Act, which was a 1948 a law passed by Congress, very unpopular with labor unions, uh, but one of the things in the Taft-Hartley Act was what they called the back-to-work clause. It meant you were forced back to work while the negotiations went on. This is because it was a national emergency, so Eisenhower felt he was justified in activating this. And then he sent Vice President Richard Nixon to uh, negotiate and mediate between the, the two uh, parties that were unhappy with each other. There were huge wage increases, there were increased benefits after the strike, and there was permanent damage done after the strike. It was a real turning point for the steel industry because the manufacturers weren't on strike, making automobiles, washers, dryers, refrigerators. So they had to get steel from somewhere, and so they started buying cheap foreign steel. And some never looked back. And this affects us to this day, when you hear people complain about cheap foreign steel coming in, affecting the domestic industry. It started to happen in 1959 with the steel workers' strike. Management of the steel. They worked in this building, just feet from where we are right now. It's a building made in, uh, built in 1916, started out as a uh, seven floor building. They added six more floors to it. Some superstitious workers said a 13 floor building. This is not good, but there it still stands, unlike its uh, successor, which was called Martin Tower, a 1972 building, that uh, $35 million high rise building two miles north of where we are, which is gone. It was imploded April of 2019. The building gets the last laugh the one that's standing right outside here from 1916. It's vacant today, but I hope it always stands there for one reason or another. All the, worker, all the uh, management people wanted corner offices. There was, shall we say, a touch of arrogance about them. They demanded corner offices and the shape of the building permitted as many corner off offices as possible. They had an elegant marble lo uh, lobby where um, there was always cut flowers, uh, attractive women to uh, take you to the upper floors where the uh, top management was and the salespeople were. And right across from where we are today, visible outside the window right there, was the carpentry and pattern shop that made all the fine furniture for the uh, top executives at Bethlehem Steel. Again, that autonomy that Bethlehem Steel loved. They ran the company well until they didn't. And they loved to play golf, as mentioned earlier. And legend has it that uh, Eugene Grace was out on the golf course with his uh, board members, his top management people, when he got the word that uh, Second World War had begun, September 1st, 1939, Germany invaded Poland. And he said to his people, legend has it, gentlemen, we're going to make a lot of money. And in fact, Bethlehem Steel made a huge amount of money during the Second World War. 
chips, tanks, ordnance. Ordnance really is uh, the ancillary things that are necessary, uh, things like jeeps and uh, ammunition and things that are important, but uh, they're called ordnance. We made lots of ammunition as well as ships and tanks. And then after the war, there was a post-war demand for consumer goods that were unavailable during the war. People couldn't get automobiles and washers and dryers and refrigerators. Ka-ching, once again, we made lots of money during the post-war era. So then there's the downhill slide, and why? During the 1960s, 70s, and 80s, management had the feeling, times are good, they'll always be good, right? And the answer was wrong. The times were changing, and management was not keeping up with it the way they should have. There was a reduction in worldwide demand for steel. First off, a lot of the country is built, I hate to say it in such a simple way, but a lot of those buildings in New York that I mentioned were built during the 1930s. Uh, so a lot of the major steel usage was already done. But there's also plastics, pre-stressed concrete, synthetics, aluminum, various alternatives to steel as we got toward the end of the last century. There were new production methods for making steel. The electric arc furnace, the EAF as the workers called it, uh, was a way of making steel that was very simple. In simple terms, scrap steel got melted down and out came new steel. What used to take 10 man hours to make a ton of steel, today takes one half man hour with the electric arc furnace. We had some, but we probably should have had more according to the critics of the company. We also didn't get as much as we should have into continuous casting. Continuous casting is using a flow of molten steel as opposed to stationary. Uh, ingots uh, to uh, it's much quicker. There's a higher um, there's a higher ability to uh, have a, a quality product, and it goes much faster. Uh, quality control is better. There were competitive new steel plants being built, and they were called mini mills, not because they were small, but because they were such a simple operation. They were being built in Alabama, Arkansas, the deep south of the United States, also the flattened ruins of war in Europe and Asia. Uh, the mini mills were taking over. Our property, remember, is not a mini mill in size or complexity. It's big. And the new ones were so simple in their operation. And management always complained that the cost of labor from a new union contract is pro prohibiting us from making any money with a ton of steel. And then there's burdensome overhead costs. Uh, we were very proud of being independent, but as we started to go downhill, we owned short, nine short line railroads. We had to divest ourselves of them. We owned an ocean going shipping line. We owned a trucking line. We owned our own quarries and mines. We had 10 plants in six states. We had burdensome overhead that was not making the money for us that it had been in the past. And here's the thing that really did us in. It's not a thing that's popularly known, but it was exponentially increasing pensions and benefits. They'd close a plant, they'd say, we've reduced our costs, we don't have to pay those people's wages. But it increased immediately the pension payouts. And it got to be a point where, at the end of the 20th century, there were a total of 11,500 people working for Bethlehem Steel nationwide. Remember, we had 30,000 on this property alone during the war, 20,000 during peacetime, 11,500 nationwide and we had 120,000 on pension benefits. The system was upside down. You can't have a system that has so few people working and so many people on pensions and benefits. We had to be bailed out by the Pension and Benefit Guarantee Company. It's an underwriter, basically an insurance company that uh, paid pensions. I've asked some people who worked here, did you get your pension? Uh, I'll let ones who, uh, worked here more recently uh, say the answer to this question, but I've heard from the people that I've asked, I got my pension, but I didn't get the benefits that I was promised. November 18th, 1995, we had what was called the last heat. It was the last time we made pig iron in our blast furnaces, and we declared bankruptcy in 2001. And by 2003, our stock had plunged to 10 cents a share, and we sold International Steel Group. And we were literally gone. Bethlehem's population in 2003 was 71,000 people. Today it's roughly 75,000. 
but in those days, 71,000, and now the steel had left town. It was devastating to this community. But we had help from local visionaries, the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, and particularly Sands Casino that bought for us 126 acres. You're sitting on part of that right now. Uh, and turned it over to uh, uh, Historic Bethlehem and other, uh, other owners and said, this is yours, maintain it. And it was Sands Casino in its day, and today is Wind Creek, but there was a seamless uh, passage of the, uh, of the agreement. And so now it's Wind Creek, but originally it was Sands. And so we came back, and we're now in the area that's called Southside. We rebranded ourselves. We have great shops and restaurants here. This is just the south side of the river. We have a charter art school. We have an ice rink. We have art studios and galleries. We have a university. We have a community college, a museum of industrial history that you're in right now, a casino and outlet shops, a PBS affiliate. This is just on the south side of Bethlehem. And you know the north side has a lot of good stuff going on for it too, including having just become a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Uh, and we have Steel Sacks, of course, which is our uh, entertainment venue and, and uh, facilities, uh, movies, and so forth. And so, like the sticker that was on your seat when you came in, Bethlehem Truly Build America. And my son and I have uh, written this book, and there's what the cover of it looks like, and uh, he's going to tell you some about the, some of the photos that he's got in the book. And I'll turn this over to him. Hello. I wanted to start off just reading an excerpt from the book. Twice in 2006, I joined a small group that obtained authorization to visit the former Bethlehem Steel Plant in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. These were incredible experiences for me. Growing up in the 1980s and 1990s, I had seen, smelled, heard, and felt Bethlehem Steel when it was still operational. It teemed with life from thousands of workers operating around the clock. The plant itself also appeared to be its own living thing as it inhaled vast loads of taconite, coke, and limestone, belched a pall of smoke and ash, poured out train car loads of glowing molten iron, and for nearly a century and a half made iron and steel for bridges, buildings, dams, railroad rail, ships, armor plating, armaments, and a huge variety of other products that created and protected the world we know. Walking and climbing among the ruins of the shuttered plane, I could still feel the energy there. Some areas retained an appearance of the workers only being on a lunch break, ready to return to their jobs at any moment. Other areas of the plant were already showing heavy signs of dilapidation, after being abandoned only a decade earlier. As my dad had uh, told you, 1995 was the last cast, the hot end operation for the Bethlehem plant. So I was there in 2006. The entire site for me held an air of veiled sorrow, of missed opportunity, and of what ifs. But within this rusting relic of American industry, I also saw overwhelming beauty in the duality of decay and stubborn perseverance of some of the structures as they were slowly being reclaimed by nature. I felt awestruck by the memories and lessons the plant continues to evoke, even in its derelict condition. My dad began offering steel tours for historic Bethlehem museums and sites in 2019, after retiring from nearly a 40-year career of university teaching and working in the communication design industry. He asked me for my photographs of the Bethlehem Steel Plant as visuals for his tour groups that would never be authorized access to the abandoned buildings or blast furnaces, instead only walking around a fenced outer perimeter. Considerable sections of the former plant are now altogether gone and have been replaced by a casino, a hotel, restaurants, shopping, and an entertainment complex. Joining one of my dad's tours and enjoying the show as the large group clung to his every word and huddled tightly to see eight by 10 prints of my photographs and a portfolio that he held up. That inspired me and us to create this book. So 
So this is the cover photo um, from the book, and so this is actually taken from part of the way up Plas Blast Furnace D, and so you're looking up river, um, Lehigh River over there on the right, and so that's Blast Furnace C and B, and then sort of hidden from the view is Blast Furnace A. It's about 150 feet up, so. Um, yeah, and that's actually, so I didn't use a drone, that's actually me up there, that's on top of Blast Furnace D, so um, David Rarig, uh, professional photographer and, and friend, I haven't spoken to him in years, but uh, uh, he took a photo of me, I yelled down to him on the ground and I asked him to take a photo, so that's me up there at the top of Blast Furnace D. Uh, incredible experience, yeah, to be able to, to climb and um, just explore the ruins. This then is looking up one of the uh, skip hoists. And so this is going up, I don't remember which blast furnace this is, but you can see the skip tubs, skip cars. Um, this photo, as much as it is, you know, nearly 20 years old, it's still basically frozen in time. So you can see that during my dad's tours. I forget if that's blast furnace B or C, I think it's one of those. Might be D. Is it D? Okay. D and D are the ones where you really see the skip tubs. Okay. And so this is actually one of the control panels for, for the skip tubs. Um, pretty neat to, to be able to see, you know, all of the functionality there, obviously, you know, abandoned and decaying, but um, it's actually high enough resolution that you can see some of it in the book. Um, but one of the things that you maybe can even see here is number 14 there is actually dumped. So that was up at the top of the skip hoist. They would dump the, uh, the load of ore into the, uh, the very top of the glass furnace. And so that one's even missing sort of the, the lights there. I guess it was used so much, it burned out, I'm not sure, but um, pretty neat. And that's just what I was explaining up at the top of the skip hoist. Um, you would have two different tracks. So this is the one track here, and then this is the second track. The rail is missing on this side. It's just cut off of the frame of the photo, but that's looking down into the very top of the blast furnace. Um, the ore would go down in here, um, you know, roughly 200 feet up. Um, and then you would have molten iron come out of there at the bottom. This is looking at the bottom. So this is the, uh, the cast floor. Um, once again, I'm not sure which one this was, sorry, 18 years ago, but this is actually the hearth of the blast furnace. And so roughly 200 feet up, obviously not in the frame of the photo, but that's the previous photo that I was showing you. So all the ore would come down um, and molten iron, molten iron would come out at the bottom here from the hearth. The hearth would be actually where they would tap from um, the, depending on what was actually taking place at the moment, you would have coming down these troughs, um, either the molten iron or the slag. And so they would be directed to railroad cars waiting below. And so one of the gates you can kind of see here, this would drop off into railroad cars, um, either the subs or the slag cars. And so really being in there and taking the photo, such high energy. Um, I can only imagine, you know, the heat and the noise, um, but yeah, you can still feel sort of the energy from the past there. One other thing interesting I'll mention too is really high roof line up here. Um, you know, they had to protect the workers and also the molten iron and the slag. And so the heat, of course, would evaporate going up, um, but you wanted to make sure that rain didn't get in there. No no, uh, you know, sleet, rain, whatever, because you could have an explosion with the molten material going through the troughs. This is looking from near the top of a blast furnace. This is actually a downcomer pipe. Um, they would recycle the gases from the top of the blast furnace and use them to start uh, reheating um, the next run. Um, or potentially the same run actually in, in the blast furnace. So it would come down, the, the waste gases would come down, they'd go through filtration equipment, and then it's kind of cut off here, but the filtration equipment, the hot gases would come over to these stoves, 
There's more stoves going over here, but you can only see part of one of them. Um, they would reheat those gases and bring the gas back into the blast furnace. They also used, uh, I forget if my dad mentioned this, but they also used some of these gases then to actually power the plant with electricity, so 25 cycle electricity. Um, 60 cycle, I guess, is where we use typically. Um, Dad, I, I forget if you mentioned it, but yeah, 60 cycle is fast enough that your eyes don't notice the flickering, but with 25 cycle, you would actually see like a flicker in the lighting, so they typically use it for heavy machinery. But yeah, they, they managed to recycle a lot of the, uh, the waste gases. Uh, my dad had mentioned the electric arc furnaces sort of towards the end of, of Bethlehem Steel's existence. And so this is an electric arc furnace here in the background. Um, this building, this whole structure is torn down now. Um, but uh, this, when it would actually be ready to pour, the whole mechanism would tilt. Um, Part of the way they would feed the electric arc furnaces with this Whitcomb switcher, and that's actually just outside here, so it's still in existence. They repainted it, restored it. Um, Whitcomb Diesel Electric, and so they would bring in uh, scrap steel, and they'd load it into the electric arc furnace. But yeah, this is, sometimes they actually have rides. Um, I think you can actually you know, drive it, so to speak special occasions and yeah I've heard the horn a couple times it's impressive coming from such a small uh, diesel electric uh, locomotive but yeah you can hear it from I don't know easily a mile away um, this is something you can still see um, during my dad's tours and so some of the steel workers they they put their names actually in the Hoover Mason trestle um, a little bit different here, you can see some of the fencing from modern times. I wasn't there, of course, in the past, um, but that's actually part of the fencing that they put in since my dad has been hosting the tours. I took a photo recently because of there's increased readability from the rain, and so you can make out you know, more of the names, the inscriptions, um, but there's a whole section there along the trestle that you can see people's names. Um, you know, left over from, from potentially decades ago. This is one of the welfare rooms at Bethlehem Steel, so I understand there were two of them. Um, this one I understand is the one that was actually for the people on the floor, the workers on the floor. Uh, there was another one that was for the executive management and just couldn't get into that building and it was just you know locked off, but I understand it was pink tile. This one has sort of a, a green Sorry, I went too fast there. This has sort of a green color to it, green brick, green tile. Um, what, would you, what you would do is actually, you had these baskets uh, instead of lockers. And so you would hang your belongings there, your boots, your shirts, um, you know, these little baskets that roughly like that size, put your car keys in there. Um, you would hoist them up to the top, up to the roof line here. You would lock them in place here with your own padlock. And then at the end of the shift, you would, you know, bring that basket down and take your belongings and go home. Um, you can see a couple of abandoned things here, most notably. It's a pair of uh, steel toe boots here, you know, waiting for their owner to return and put them back to use. But yeah, once again, kind of heavy energy in the building. But it was really fascinating and neat to see. This is Machine Shop 2, um, still in existence. Uh, I've heard a lot of interesting things about you know how they might want to repurpose this. It is abandoned right now, um, but uh, I've heard that they might turn it into a water park. Um, one of the crazier ideas, I suppose. But uh, I guess if it helps preserve the building, you know, why not? Um, but yes, you can't really get a full feel for, for the length of the building in this photo, but from this end all the way to the far end where I'm taking the photo from and a little bit beyond, it was roughly a third of a mile long, and it set a record in the 1890s um, for longest building in the world. Eventually surpassed, but yeah, for a while it was a record holder. And that was it. Those were some of my favorite photos for you. Uh, 10 or 11 photos. There's roughly 125 photos in the book. Um, you're more than welcome to page through it. But uh, yeah, thank you so much for your interest and for being here today.